Professor Dunch, first, let me just uh, thank you for agreeing to be part of this interview series. I, I should say at the outset how honored I am in particular for, uh, for this opportunity to interview you because you you've have this astonishing record of, of having written, published, having spoken at talks and papers, uh, a great deal about the, the topic about which you know this series is, is, is regarding that is history of Christ the study of um, China Christianity studies. Um, and it especially you published and researched in the area of Protestant Christianity in China, thinking about the late Qing into the Republican era, certainly even uh, into the post uh, uh, Republican era. Uh, you've written on the topic of Christian missions and the question of cultural imperialism. Certainly you've, you've thought a lot about adaptation to socialism in China regarding the Christian mission. And your most read uh, work certainly is your book on Fuzhou Protestants. But uh, just uh, before I ask you the first question, uh, one of the things that several of people working on this series have said about you in particular is that you've done a great deal to elevate the um, the reputation of this field. Uh, that is, decades ago, uh, certainly the study of Christianity in China was somewhat marginal, and uh, you've presented a number of papers and talks that have done much to really um, promote uh, this field as an important academic discipline. So anyway, that's something that uh, several others have wanted me to convey to you. But the point here is to ask you questions. So the first question really is an introductory one, and that is what brought you to the field of China Christianity studies? And then I guess added to that, uh, what interested you in particular about the areas about which you've researched? Okay, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that introduction and the kind words. I I, uh, I I hope that I've done something, and it's nice to hear that I may have done. Um, it's uh, of course the what brought me to the field of China Christianity studies. It goes back forty years, almost forty years for me. I actually came to an interest in Chinese studies and in Christianity. Uh, pretty much at the same time as a young adult in my final year of high school and going into university in Australia. And so they've always been intertwined for me and it's been a very intertwined story of uh, how my life trajectory has, has gone and, and the kind of um, interplay between Chinese studies and Christianity studies uh, and Christianity itself. So. In my BA years at the Australian National University and in my the time I spent in Taiwan as an undergraduate student when I was 20, 20 years old. And uh, after, my, after I finished my BA, I spent a few more years in Hong Kong in the late 1980s. And in, in all of those settings, and particularly in, in Hong Kong and in Taiwan, I experienced uh, Chinese Christianity as a Chinese social reality and in a Chinese idiom. And so for me, that generated an interest in, in sort of seeing the history of Chinese Christianity as a Chinese history uh, and as part of Chinese history and as a kind of, and working to kind of bring it into the mainstream of the stories we tell about modern modern China, late imperial and modern China. Uh, and so that was really my kind of um, motivational factor, I think, from very early on, um, before my PhD. Um, and then I went into the PhD thinking that I, it might be uh, a good thing to study Watchman Nee. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I was very fortunate at Yale to have encouragement to go with my ideas and sort of explore them and see what uh, what worked. And I also was fortunate to have funding to travel to China in the first year, first summer of my PhD. And I was also very fortunate to have letters of introduction to important scholars from uh, Professor Zhang Kaiyuan, who was uh, that that year was a uh, 
a loose foundation scholar at Yale. Um, and anyone who knows the history of this field knows that that's a magical name. <laughs> and letters from Professor Zhang uh, who uh, opened, um, opened doors for me uh, in that very brief couple of weeks that I, I, I traveled, uh, I think from Hong Kong to Xiamen, Fuzhou, and Shanghai, uh, and then back to Connecticut. Um, but, uh, and I was going with this idea of, you know, I was kind of explore, exploring possible focus for a PhD dissertation, uh, but starting with the, the, the idea that Watchman Nee might be a promising um, avenue. Uh, and this was in, what year was it? It was in the summer of 1990. Um, no, sorry, no, it wasn't. I was in the summer of 1992. Yeah, no, the summer of 1990, I think would have been a, that soon after 1989 would have been a more difficult um, thing. Uh, no, the summer of 1992, by, by which time things were starting to sort of, you know, open up and uh, I think Deng Xiaoping had done his trip to Shenzhen at that point. And, um, Mm. So, uh, and it's then in Fuzhou that uh, I met uh, Professor Lin Jinshui, and I came to know that in Fuzhou they housed a lot of, uh, uh, had preserved a lot of research materials from the, the history of the, the Qing and Republican periods and the Protestant churches in the Fujian area or in the Fuzhou area in that time period. And um, I also, I came back from that trip persuaded that probably Watchman Nee was still not, was still kind of a no-go topic, uh, at least for research within China. Um, of course he was, uh, put on trial and uh, and convicted as a counter-revolutionary in the early 1950s and he died in prison in 1973 I believe. Uh, I did learn that at least it was said to me that at that time there was a a long uh, written self-criticism probably um, 100,000 characters that Watchman Nee had authored while in prison, and that was in the Shanghai Public Security Bureau. Um, I think it's, uh, I, th I think that it, that was a reliable report that that thing existed at that time in the early 90s. Uh, whether it still exists and is preserved today, I don't know and I wouldn't speculate, but uh, it's actually an illustration, I think, of one of the realities of this of this area of research is there's lots of material that is lost, of course, but lots of material that may still be out there and is yet to be uncovered, uh, which is one of the fun things about this area. So that's kind of a longish answer to how I came into this area of research. You, know, you mentioned that <laughs> um, one of your interests sort of as an undergraduate was um, thinking about the history of Christianity in China as a Chinese history. And uh, one of the things I think that, 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 that has, one of the sort of historical contours of this field has been that it, it is largely shifted from a kind of missionary focus enterprise of research to mm -hmm. one that thinks about uh, Chinese Christianity as, as part of its own history. Um, mm -hmm. And that's an interesting shift that I think that has happened evolutionarily in our, in our field. But I guess to sort of ask the next question then, which really segues from that is, was there ever anything that you discovered while conducting your research or in, 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 in archival work or in your reading that, that really made you think differently about the topic, that sort of shifted your thinking? Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a great question. I've sort of uh, thought a bit about that. And I think there's, there's a number of things. One of the... Um, 
in the, in the late 80s and the early 90s when I was getting into history as such, uh, my undergrad degree was actually a, a, an Asian studies degree focusing more on language and literature, Chinese language and literature. But um, uh, when I was getting into history as such and the, the, the people who influenced me, you know, in the 80s and 90s, or late 80s and 90s, I'm not that old, <laughs> um, were the, um, I think there was a, an assumption that if you wanted to look for the, the, the Chinese story of Ch Chinese Protestant Christianity, that the place to look was with the sectarian movements mm -hmm. of the early 20th century. And Watchman Nee, of course, is, is one of those. Um, the True Jesus Church, another, um, you know, and there, there are plenty of others. But the, um, uh, I think so. So it was actually looking at those materials in Fujian Normal in the summer of 1992, and then in my, I believe it was my second year at Yale that I did a, a sort of further investigation. No, it wasn't. It was the first year. I did a, f a sort of annotated bibliography for um, uh, Professor Bartlett, uh, Betsy Bartlett, uh, Beatrice Bartlett, um, scholar of Chinese, uh, of, uh, of Qing China and the Chinese archival system in particular. Um, and uh, so I'd already become aware that there were some just interesting accounts of the late 19th century and early 20th century that were kind of important backdrop to the world that, that Watchman Nee emerged from. Um, but it also, that material made me realize that you didn't need to think of the independent Chinese Protestant uh, entrepreneurial revivalists as being the beginning of a distinctly Chinese sort of way of conceptualizing Christianity, that it had been happening all along, that every, every you know, Chinese person who embraced Christianity in some form in the late Qing period did so in a Chinese idiom and it experienced Christianity in a Chinese idiom. So I began to think more about that and to think more about how you look at um, those uh, Christian converts and their, and the second and third and fourth generations as, uh, as operating in their, their Chinese world. And that, was a, that became the kind of core research question that drove my dissertation that became the Fuzhou Protestants book. Um, and uh, I, some of the earlier scholarship going back to the 60s and 70s uh, that focused on missionaries is simply referred to all the Chinese preachers and other people associated with the missions as Chinese helpers, as, as a sort of collective term and rather dismissive term of Chinese helpers, or you know, or the or the kind of general categories like coal porters, Bible women, and so on. But of course, they're all individuals. They're all sort of making decisions, and uh, and the missionaries whose sources uh, and accounts, you know dominate the source record to some extent, but they, they are at least the, the source record in Western languages. They're, you know, they're an externality from the point of view of, you know, Chinese society and, and Chinese Christians and how Chinese Christians are thinking, even back in the, you know, in the earliest periods, I think. So that's what, um, and, and I, I believe that that same kind of, um, awareness has really become much more uh, embedded in the scholarship that we have now. Uh, and I think of Henrietta Harrison's book, and I think of Eugenia Menegon's book, and many others, you know, that have 
really looked at the, the ways in which Chinese people experienced, embraced, transformed, reconfigured uh, Christianity and, and used Chinese language and other language sources to do it. Um, oh, so a research discovery. So, so yeah, that was kind of a way that made me, th it was kind of, that's kind of not a particular research discovery. It was, if, if I had to point to particular things, I would say that the um, discovering in the Yale, uh, the Day Missions Library at Yale, uh, uh, Xu Yangmei's translated account of his life that is called in English, The Way of Faith Illustrated. Very interesting book. Um, and from the written in, forget now when it was published. I think the early 18, or around the 18, 1890, something like that. I think his daughter was abroad when it was published uh, and she was abroad studying medicine from 1885 to 1895, something like that uh, in the States. Um, but I'm going on memory here, but it's, it's still, it, that was a, a, I mean, a fascinating book that just, you know, shows you the things I've been saying that, you know, Chinese people experience Christianity in the terms of their world, not in the terms of the missionary world. Uh, and then in Fujian, there are some commemorative volumes from the early, from the Republican period of the churches. Uh, I, there's one of a, uh, of a particular church, Tianantang. There's one of the Fuzhou Conference of the Methodist Church writ large. Uh, it's kind of an institutional history. Not really an institutional history. No, that's the wrong term. It's, it's, it's written really as a, it's, it's a Chinese genre of commemorative volume, right? And, um, but the one that really struck me was the one of the, the Methodist church in Minqing County, which was, you know, it's this tiny county and, and not a very large church, but it's somebody from Minqing County did a commemorative volume of this, I think, 75 years of, of the Methodist Church in Minchin County, and, and that is the county where Huang, Huang Naishang was from, uh, who figures prominently in the Fuzhou Protestants book. But it, it's a fascinating volume, a very slim volume, but it, um, it's one of the first things I spent time sort of delving into when I lived in, in Fuzhou for my uh, field research, which was from sort of uh, 93 to 94, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was like September 93 to July of 94. Um, and, um, you know, that was uh, uh, because it's such a, a sort of familiar Chinese genre of publication. It was, again, something that may allowed me to see um, these denominational churches as being much more interesting than they would appear if you just assume these are sort of colonized people who are just little little American Methodists but happen to be in China. They're not that at all, right? <laughs> there's, there's, uh, um, so I think it's, you know, all, all of these two things together, you know, showed me a more complicated and contested story of the history of Chinese Christianity, uh, and that um, hopefully some some of that was captured in the Fuzhou Protestant book. And then, so that's a, that's an already rather long answer, but I I didn't stop. Uh, although my you've been very kind about my research, but I've actually been doing a lot of academic administration in the last ten years. Um, and I've been a bit slow to uh, produce new work in this area that's published work anyway. Um, but my, the project I've been working on uh, for, for far too long uh, is a kind of um, uh, holistic 
study of Chinese Christian publications from uh, or from the um, time of Robert Morrison until the 1911 revolution, which is con very conveniently 100 years because Morrison's first Chinese publication <laughs> appeared in 1811. Um, and, um, and that interest uh, came out of the Fuzhou project just project. in realizing that there was a lot of things that a, a we can't find now or b that have never been looked at seriously uh, i think i was first stimulated by seeing a, a volume of letters from the fujo christians to uh, robert samuel mcclay who was a methodist um, missionary early methodist missionary in fujo who then went to japan and they wrote him a volume of letters and mid 1870s and I found a copy I've still never done anything really with it but just the fact that there's these first-hand letters in a published volume that um, nobody's really paid attention to got me interested in this and then I, I of course in digging progressively from about 2000 onwards I found that there's you know far more than I imagined of this material uh, that is uh, Christian publications in Chinese uh, and various forms of Chinese uh, over that hundred year period. Um, but one of the exciting research discoveries was finding, you know, Chinese Christian books in the British Library that <laughs> probably, that with uncut pages, right? And it probably hadn't been pulled off the shelves in a hundred years, right? Um, and then at the Australian National University in, um, uh, sorry, not Australian National Library, I beg your pardon, <laughs> in Canberra, uh, where the London Missionary Society uh, Library Collection is, uh, finding um, editions of the four classic, uh, the four books for women, the New Sushu, with Helen Nevius's, well, at least probably Helen Nevis's own handwritten emendations in, in, the, in the volume saying, we should get rid of this and, you know, we should cut this. And, uh, and then that became uh, the, the, vo the um, amended Christianized version of the Nusa Shu that she published in 1904, I think. Uh, you mentioned something that I, I don't want to forget to ask you about, and that is that in the British Library, you located these Chinese Christian published documents with uncut pages. Well, mm. this begs a question. What do you do at the British Library when you want to have the pages cut? I, I, didn't, I, I did not damage the books, and I didn't cut the pages myself. I also didn't... Um, I also, I think, assumed that I'd be back soon. <laughs> so I took good notes. Uh, I noted the existence of the volume. I th I, if I'm remembering rightly, this was a, um, a compendium of several tracts that had then been bound together, stitched together into a single volume, either at the library or prior to the library's acquisition of it. Um, so I have notes on it somewhere. Um, but it's, that's certainly one of those moments as a scholar where, at least for me anyway, I would be, I would be sort of contemplating how, how do I petition the librarian know, to cut the pages? It would be nerve wracking, right? Because <laughs> you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want it to be taken away. Right. And, and you, wouldn't want to be, you wouldn't want to hit a block of someone saying this can't possibly be done. Although that might in fact be the, the answer. Yeah, that's a challenging um, one. Let me ask the next question. Uh -huh. First off, is it, you, you, you've touched upon several things that have caught my attention. One is, is sort of admixed within your recollections on what may have changed your course and changed your thinking was, was this discovery or at least this sort of realization that <clears throat> Chinese Christianity has always been Chinese Christianity. And that within this milieu of their, their own culture, they're already thinking in this, uh, in this what we might call indigenized, I mean, I wouldn't, that's, that's absolutely not a word term that should be used, but 
certainly there are already Chinese Christians underline the word Chinese, right? Um, and, mm -hmm. when, and then you, you've mentioned uh, Ni Tuo Sheng several times. Mm -hmm. And uh, here in Eastern Washington, interestingly, the most flourishing Chinese church is a Watchman Ni church, all, oh. in, all in Chinese. And that movement really ha has its dendrites all over the planet, the yes. Watchman Ni movement. And even here in Eastern Washington, where we, I wouldn't assume it, it it's here. Um, and then you also mentioned your year of, 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 of archival research in, in, in Fuzhou. And I want to mm. just go back to China a bit. Um, and I'm also very taken by your comment that commemorative booklets or books, uh, there's something that I know many scholars have encountered, church commemorative booklets that mm. recount a number of names, uh, dates of institutional you know, institutional events, uh, different pastors, that kind of thing. Um, and we do uncover uh, new documents everywhere. Hmm. But, but this takes me back to China. Um, uh, one thing we're interested in is if you, if you have a particular uh, meaningful moment that you've experienced while you were in China conducting your research. Yeah. Uh... I, I would say that um, often that's conversations, you know, talking with my interlocutors and interview subjects um, uh, in Fujian and elsewhere. Uh, certainly back at that time, um, I talked quite often to, uh, uh, I lived next door to the, the uh, Tianan Tang, the, the Church of Heavenly Peace, uh, which is an old Methodist church in Fuzhou, and I talked quite often to the pastor there, Xu Lebin, who is now deceased, but he is he was a great grandson, I think, of of one of the three Xu brothers of the Methodist Church mm. of the late uh, so the late Qing period. Um, so that probably made him a fifth generation Christian. Um, and he was a very interesting man, uh, both in his recollections of his family history, but in, in his own personal story. He, he went back to seminary. He went to seminary in the early 1950s, quite intentionally, um, knowing seeing what was happening and knowing what was what might come i suppose you know but that was his um decided that was his calling uh and then i uh, his cousin well they're all cousins but <laughs> uh 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 miss Shu Daofeng, who was uh, a um teacher at the huanan uh college which was a kind of a, a recreated private women's college uh, close to the campus of the old old uh, Christian college, uh, Huanan Women's College. Um, but she was also a descendant of the Xu, the Xu family and, uh, and she was very interesting to talk to because she had these recollections of this very interesting figure, uh, Xu, Xu, Xu Jinhong, the, the the women, the woman uh, Methodist woman doctor who was uh, the second woman, I think, trained in Western medicine in all of China, um, and who had a, a 30 year career as head of one of the missionary hospitals in Fuzhou until 1927. So that was, I mean, that was sort of, these are meaningful and memorable moments. And then actually back in the US, I, I had a really interesting afternoon interviewing um, some of the uh, some other descendants of important Methodist figures in Fuzhou and learn things. You learn things sometimes in interviewing thing, people that you wouldn't learn from the written record, of course, right? I mean, this is obvious, but, uh, and then uh, more recently, I had a very memorable afternoon of conversation 
with the scholars in the Institute for World Religions, um, including uh, um, oh, why am I blanking out? It's a very, the very important uh, director who is now the vice president of CAS. Uh, yes, so uh, in any case, this was a so, more recent discussion. Yes, yes, we had a, a good afternoon talking about uh, research on religion in China, the place of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in the Chinese, uh, uh, what's the word, political and academic right. system. Um, and where, where it occupies a very important place, the, the origin of the Institute for World Religions uh, in, in uh, Chairman Mao Zedong's desire to have a kind of uh, a think tank that could inform Chinese policy about world, world religions um, and how they saw the world at that time and the, um, the situation of Christian churches in China at that time. This was, it wasn't in, it was uh, 2011, I think. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and of course it was shortly after that, that the, um, the independent uh, Shouwang Church in Beijing started to come under increased pressure. And then, uh, so it was, a, it was a kind of optimistic moment where those researchers were quite sure that, you know, things were just getting better and the Shouwang Church was fine, could operate just fine, even though there was restrictions and, um, but that's no long, you can no longer look at the situation quite so optimistically, I think. Right. I'm thinking of Joy yes. Xinping or Yang Huilin as uh, people who are thinking about that, at least in the mainland China. Zhuo Xinping is who Zhuo Xinping, I okay. I, I think I should have known myself. <laughs> yeah, and, and Yang Huilin was, was there as well, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, <coughs> So let me ask then, we've asked everyone this particular question, and that is if, and obviously we, we really want to hear more about your own experience, but, but there, is, there is this one question uh, that we're asking, and that is, could you recall a pleasant memory you have regarding another scholar in our fields? Maybe a, a memory of someone else that you think should be remembered in the whole area of China Christianity studies? Sure. Yeah, and it's 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 a long list. It's hard to um, it could be more than one. Hard to narrow down, right? Um, I've already mentioned uh, Professor Zhang Kaiyuan, and uh, uh, I had the I had the honor really of meeting him again in I was probably that same time, 2011, 2012. Uh, when I was in Beijing, but I took a side trip to Wuhan and uh, talked on their campus and uh, um, and had a dinner that uh, that Professor Zhang attended. In fact, he's so he's so revered in China that um, pe the people at the dinner didn't call him. Uh, Zhang Jiaoshou or Zhang Xiaozhang, they call him Zhang Xiansheng. Oh, it's almost wow. like you, you're, so, <laughs> you're so above any of these earned titles that you can only be referred right. to as Xiansheng. Right. <laughs> very, very interesting. Of course, you learn all the time in these interactions, right? Um, and uh, uh, of course, Daniel Bayes, I, I uh, I have very fond memories of Dan. He was uh, a great help to me in uh, as I sort of ventured into graduate school um, and uh, during my Yale years he he was a an informal mentor and sometimes a formal one. He was uh, I think asked to anyway. Um, in Fuzhou, uh, Professor Lin Jinchui was was very helpful, and we had some 
we, we, we had a great year in Fuzhou. We, we were, uh, my, my wife and I had our first child with us. She was 10 months old when we arrived and 20 months when we left. And, um, and of course she got loads of attention uh, from people on the street, as well as from, you know, my professors and colleagues uh, at um, Fujian Normal. Um, she also got worms, but not from them. That was that was from <laughs> on the street. <laughs> uh, and uh, and more recently, um, uh, Professor Tafeya has been, you know. Uh, a great sort of inspiration and help and um, um, and Gary Tiedemann. I had the pleasure of seeing him uh, a couple of years ago at a conference in that I think was October of 2018 um, and had some good conversations with him. Of course, the late Gary Tiedemann and the late Daniel Bass at, at this point. Um, but also, uh, you know, K.K. Lee at, at Hong Kong Baptist University and Nankong Wong have been, um, it's been a pleasure to meet up with them from time to time. And uh, Chloe Starr at Yale. Uh, Chloe and I first met when I was at a conference in Heidelberg and she turned around and passed me a note saying, I'm looking forward to your panel, <laughs> and, I, and that that was like my first interaction at this conference where I knew nobody. So suddenly I knew someone that was good, um, and we've been been friends ever since, really, and uh, uh, and have had uh, sort of ongoing discussions about intellectual matters and so on, which has has really been helpful. Uh, yeah, there's lots of, and, and then I, I think. I don't really talk much about my time in Hong Kong in the late 1980s, from 1987 to the middle of 1989. But I worked at the time for an organization called the Chinese Church Research Center, which was uh, run by Jonathan Zhao, Zhao Tianan, uh, who was a very interesting figure. He was um, a, uh, had a PhD actually in history, uh, but was really a theologian. His father was a translator of theological works in Taiwan and came out of a reformed theological background, but ran this organization that was very early on labeled an anti-China organization uh, by um, you know, figures within, within, within mainland China and within the Three Self Movement. So it was, uh, but I learned a lot from, from those years and from the discipline actually of reading, reading and writing weekly that I did at that time. Um, and uh, uh, Zhao Tianan's uh, dissertation was actually about the independent Protestant church movements of the early 20th century. So it's a kind of, it was never published as a book, but it's still a, an important uh, work to consult on that topic and, and that period. Um, so I think even though he's a sort of controversial figure who didn't, he, who didn't operate in an ap academic milieu, he was uh, also a formative figure in this, in this field of study. You mentioned this, um, and I think I, I think I should say that uh, you mentioned Daniel Bayes and Gary Tiedemann, and I think I should say that the, the whole one of the inspirations behind this interview series was their passing, mm. uh, and and uh, a, a number of scholars were these sort of exchanging emails and discussing uh, how how much of a hole that left in our field to see the passing of of, of Dan Bayes and Gary Tiedemann, and. Uh, it really inspired us to try and interview people, uh, both junior scholars and scholars who are in a, a, a later season. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned both of those. But uh, the last question then, um, and I may, I, may, um, I may add, I may amend one or, or have one sort of added question. Uh, 
but um, could you tell us what, if you were to envision the future of the field, China Christianity studies, um, what hopes do you have? I'd say, um, uh, two things. I, I think we're in a time right now of downturn in academic stages, in academic exchanges between scholars in different countries and who work in different languages. And I'm thinking, of course, particularly of China-based China scholars versus outside scholars, but it could apply more broadly as well. Um, there, but you know, there were vigorous sort of exchanges in the 1980s and a little later in the 1990s, and and I think those interactions became more fully two-way interactions in the 2000s. Um, and it's still, you know, this it, this is still a vigorous area of research within China, and there's lots of. You know, doctoral students doing new work um, with, I think, rather rather fewer opportunities for study abroad than was than were true even five years ago right. for right. Chinese scholars, uh, particularly for emerging scholars within China. Um, and you know, and and we're at a diff difficult moment in uh, relations between nation states in the world generally, <laughs> as well as between the, the PRC nation state and others. Um, and, and so that's a, that's a difficult context. Um, but I hope for a renewed energy and an open context for academic exchanges so that we can learn from each other and stimulate each other um, uh, across different national and linguistic um, settings. Uh, so that would be one thing. And then I also hope I've been, you know, I, you know, the world of academics and what we do as academics is, and this applies whether, you know, you're talking about churches in any setting, with, whether it's China or elsewhere, but I think particularly when it comes to Chinese Christianity or Christianity within the People's Republic of China, there's, there's a fairly big disconnect between the stuff that academics do and care about and the stuff that filters into the, the awareness of church people. And I hope that that, can, that gap can close a little. Uh, you know, maybe, I mean, the Catholic situation is, is probably somewhat different, but I think it's a challenge regardless whether it's Catholic or Protestant. And, and I think having sort of academic um, work kind of uh, bring back to life a kind of sense of, of belonging to a larger story that would be helpful to, to Chinese Christians. And, and I think that's been something that I've sort of hoped that our, that our collective work would do um, without necessarily knowing how one gets to do that. You're, you're not the first person to mention this desire for it, it really a return to um, more ease of communication. Uh, between scholars of different uh, nation states. It's certainly something I think it's agonizing most of us. Well, um, uh, let me add one comment dash question uh, and by way of concluding. That is, you know, you, you mentioned administrative duties and this project that you're working on. And now uh, I myself am a chair and a director of Asian studies and the chair of my department. And I know what, that, what the, what the uh, flow of uh, incoming emails looks like. Um, especially now as we're just dealing with uh, so many uh, um, adjustments uh, mm -hmm. going into a fall semester with, with the coronavirus and all of that. Um, but you, you're working on, a, on, on a, a work that I've heard many scholars are very interested in, and that is the, the history of publication. Um, I wonder if you could just say a little bit more mm. about that project, <clears throat> because you mentioned it rather, rather in passing. 
and okay. uh, and and I know of many people who would be extremely, especially 1811, Morrison to 1911. This is a rich period of publication. The presses are being established all over. The Jesuits in Shanghai. There's one in Hong Kong mm -hmm. called the Nazareth Publication. So can you just say a little bit more about what your what your what your aims are? <laughs> My. My aim is to is to establish a kind of um, handle on this work. I, I mean, I have an, a, a bibliography that uh, there's a clunky version online um, that you can find via my university website, but uh, the, it's not a very good. The search interface is not very good on it, and. Uh, but the bibliography is consists of about 2,500 items, hmm. and that's uh, not including editions of the Bible or parts of the Bible, and it doesn't include periodicals. I decided early on that those had been well studied separately, and I'd leave them out. So it's just all the other stuff. So it's a huge volume of material. I, I have to say that the Catholic material is underrepresented, although not left out entirely. But I've I relied on um, on catalogs that were cre created during the late Qing period as a sort of basic data entry source for most of the material, uh, and most of those were connected to the Protestant world. Um, but um, but what I would like to do, and, and really what I've intended from the beginning, <laughs> is to uh, is to provide an an overview of this material, and then to um, to go in in depth on some particular genres or aspects of it. Um, so at the moment, you know, it's just dribbles of that research have appeared in some publications, um, but uh, the main bulk of that work is still in front of me. And uh, and I signed on for another five-year term as a department chair. So I'm, <laughs> I'm one year through that, four, year, four to go. Uh, It's and of course it's it's been, you know the the amount of um, transformation in digital possibilities since I began this work in two thousand compared to today, you know has been very dramatic and I mean, um, although I, I worry I mean now it's possible to think oh wow we could actually like put editions facsimile editions online and things like that. Um, I, I always worry about the um, long-term preservation of the work that we make available di digitally. Um, I think it's a challenge that we're, we're th everyone's thinking about, but it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a perennial challenge uh, for, for the time to come. Um, Yeah, but that's, I mean, that's basically what the work consists of. And I'm, I'm very happy to correspond with scholars about it and to um, talk with people about it. And I've, um, it's, I've even got things in my inbox <laughs> to the bottom that need attention related to it. Well, this is, it is good. It is good to hear two things. And it's good to hear that you're still, uh, you still have that ahead of you. You're also very young. I should say, as um, as I think about my own season, uh, I think we're both still we still have uh, many decades ahead of us. I, I should I should hope. Um, well, yeah. I was I am turning fifty eight this year, so many decades might be a stretch, but well, I'll I'll I'll, I'll work on while I can and while my wife lets me. Well, sure. I'll give you a one sui one sui. <laughs> So, you know, let me take this opportunity to do something I really like to do. And that is, you know, we, I, I certainly have read your, your, some of your work, much of your work. And uh, as someone like you who spends so much time, I spend the time here in my office, um, 
I often read uh, someone's work and think, gosh, I'm so grateful uh, for the work. I know that I know the requirement it, it, that, that, is, uh, that is needed to produce scholarship. So I just want to take this moment to thank you personally for well, your you. contribution to this field. And, um, and I know I'm not alone. Uh, in the scholarly community who are grateful for your work. And um, um, so thank you for that. And thank you very much for agreeing to be interviewed. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anthony. And thank you for doing this interview series. And, and of course, for your own work and scholarship. But, uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great idea. And I'll look forward to seeing uh, the, the interviews when they're compiled. Uh -huh.